learning. This is awesome. All right, I had to write this down, so I'm going to introduce our speaker here, then I'm going to get out of here so we can all listen to the one we actually want to hear. So Kristen Rowe was a trial lawyer for 16 years before uh, leaving in 2019 to pursue her passion of helping people understand nutrition. And not just any trial lawyer, she was named one of Minnesota's top 50 women attorneys by super lawyers, and that's pretty impressive, but not as impressive as this in my opinion. Kristen is now a functional nutritional therapist, and on top of that, she's a natural professional IPE bodybuilder. You're going to have to tell us exactly what that means because it sounds pretty cool, but this I know what it means, and has run 25 marathons. That's a lot of miles, you guys. That's like almost like 1,000 or something. It's, 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 like, it's like 500 <laughs> or something, yeah. Um, Kristen uses her pers uh, persuasive argument skills that the trial lawyer to end her vast personal experiences to educate people on the nutrition. Um, if you need more paper for notes, it's back there, and you might need it. Last but not least, uh, Kristen lives in Minneapolis with her two golden retrievers, Catch and Belle, correct? Yep. Um, her love of golden retrievers is what inspired her Instagram handle, MN Golden Girl. Please give a warm welcome to Kristen. breaking food down a little further.
U-T-O-P-H-A-G-Y. The gentleman who discovered that won a Nobel Prize in 2015 for that discovery. Ever since 2015, we've been translated self-eating. <laughs> completely morbid and no worries yes I can say something real quick <laughs> can you hear me now can you hear me now hey I have the best view in the house okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's okay. I haven't even gotten into the PowerPoint yet, so i got to get started. So I have my phone up here, you guys, just sidebar, with a timer on, because I'm so used to judges with a timer. Because every time you're in court, Supreme Court, Court of Appeals, they've got this timer and the buttons, and it's going down, so you're like, okay, okay, what else do I have to say? So I'm looking at my timer, and not as tough of a crowd, which is great. Um, Heather, the other thing I should ask is, Will this just work to move forward? Okay, perfect. It will. Good. Okay. Second. Metabolically flexible. Your body back and forth forces each month. Your body knows how to use them. But the short version is, it's when you are in that burning fat for fuel, for fuel, you produce for your brain, okay? So your brain glucose or ketones. That's what I want everyone to hear because it's really important to understand. Here's why I want you guys to get metabolic flexibility. We now know that there is such a connection that we call those diseases diabetes type. So if for no other reason, I want you to off that Alzheimer's and dementia risk as we age. Every single one of you born in a state of ketosis. Babies are born in ketosis. You aren't born as a sugar burner. We create sugar burners in this country because by the age of two, we're stuffing humans with all sorts of sugar, from the squeezy pouches to the goldfish crackers to the juice boxes to the granola bars, you name it. All of that is causing our bodies to constantly become burners of sugar, carbs, glucose. And I'm going to use sugar, carbs, and glucose interchangeably during this talk. They're not really the exact same thing, but for the purposes of what I'm going to communicate to you today, just think of them that way. So you can't start to burn dietary fat until your body burns off the sugar. You can't start to burn body fat until your body burns off the sugar, then burns off the dietary fat, then, burns, then can burn body fat, okay? And that's when you start to produce ketones. That's why you see people have these successful weight loss stories on a ketogenic diet. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I think anyone should be in ketosis all the time. This is why I started this talk with metabolic flexibility. I had 117 grams of carbohydrates yesterday. I was back into ketosis by 11.30 today after fasting. So that's what I mean when I say metabolic flexibility. I could have carbs yesterday, but I exercised a lot this morning. I sweat a ton. I had a bunch of water. I had some coffee with MCT oil. And all of that worked to get my body back into ketosis. So I crash and need more food. When you crash and need more food, it's because you're constantly going on carbs, okay? So what I do in my courses and what I do in my one-on-one -on -one coaching is I spend about the five weeks for the general person teaching your body how to start to burn fat for fuel instead of just carbs all day long. All of us were raised in a generation of carbs, 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 me included. So this is something that we have to unlearn, and you're never going to hear about this in mainstream media or on any 
television because it's not what sells. Big food and big pharma are what sell on those kinds of programs. So you have to learn about this kind of stuff through grassroots. Okay. I'll shut up for a minute about that. Let me just tell you a little bit more about who I am. So here's what I do. I help clients lose body fat and gain lean muscle. Clients reach out to me because they want to gain weight. For the most part, people are looking to improve their body composition by losing body fat and gaining lean muscle tissue. So I educate people about macronutrients and why they matter. And I've already talked to you about macronutrients today, that macronutrients means protein, fat, and carbs. That's it. There's only three. That's all you have to remember with macronutrients, so there are three. I really get people to be intentional about what they put in their mouth. Most of us are grabbing things at the grocery store, putting things in front of our families, putting things on the plate, kind of out of habit. And we're not really thinking about how much of this is protein, how much of this is fat, how much of this is carbs. So every time I eat, that's what I'm thinking about. Where's my protein? Where's my protein? Where's my protein? That's the first question that I want everyone to ask. I want you to prioritize older age, and it really is the most important macronutrient that we can consume. It's going to contribute to better hair, better nails, all of those things. And what I see most often, especially with women, is that we woefully, woefully under eating protein. And the next one is fat. Fill in with fat. Okay, so I always say prioritize protein. Of course, this is what I always have to say as a long I'm going to make a trademark about this someday. <laughs> Prioritize protein, fill in with fat, and carefully add carbs. And I really, in a perfect world, you guys, every time we consumed carbs, they would come from things like vegetables, some fruits, and the occasional sweet potato, white potato, some gluten-free rice, those kinds of things. Not the things I call horrible, not even food, which I know I'm sure lots of people have in their cupboards right now. I used to, too, so I'm not... Shaming anyone, I just want to wake you up to this. Wheat thins are not food. They're not. Here's what they are. I'm going to tell you the ingredients, because I've looked this up so many times, and if I still was in the practice of law, I'd probably sue Nabisco for poisoning America. It is sugar, gluten, industrial seed oils that jack up your, they, they totally screw up metabolism. And then they do, they sprinkle some pixie dust on it and claim that there are like, there aren't. So they'll put things to make you feel better if you ever read the ingredients label. I mean, even on goldfish crackers, they've done this. I think it's goldfish crackers where they added, made with a smile. <laughs> Please, right? It's so insulting. So my parents, I grew up in a home where my dad was a dentist. So of course we couldn't have Captain Crunch. We couldn't have tricks. But we could have Cheerios and Kicks and rice, right? All of that is the same. It's all sugar and industrial seed oils. I haven't touched cereal, and I can't tell you how many years. So a lot of what I do in my education with clients is I'm deprogramming you from how you look at and think about food. I no longer even go down certain aisles in the grocery store because there's no point. Because when I look at those aisles, I'm like, uh, no, too tempting. No, I love donuts. Oh, I love cereal. No, 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 oh, go over here because it's not food. So really what I'm thinking about is, okay, where in the store can I get the protein? How can I get the healthy fats? And surprise, most of that comes from real food, okay? So that's about getting intentional. And then I cut through the uh, information overwhelm when it comes to nutrition and fitness, as I've already said, and create transformational change in the lives of my clients. And I have some clients here, which is awesome. So this is what I like to show when I first do this topic, because I've told you guys a little bit about the fact that a lot of people run on carbs, that they're... We are a country of written perspective. So what this first map is, and some of my clients who are here have already seen this, but it's so powerful. And as you can see, right, this data is directly from the CDC. Okay. Now what this shows is from 1985, obesity trends among U.S. adults in the United States. You can query or quibble, rather, with their definition of obesity, but for the purposes of the CDC, they consider obesity having a BMI of over 30 or being approximately 30 pounds overweight for a 5'4 person. Okay, that's what they're using as a definition. So as you can see by the key on the bottom left, the white states have it reported. The light blue states like Minnesota, only less than 10% of that population is reporting as obese. And in the darker blue states, 
it is 10 to 14% of that population reporting as obese. So I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly and I just want you to watch what happens, okay? Can you guys see? Okay, this is 1986, 87. One, we have another color. So now we have states where 15, 19% of their population is reporting as obese. There. <laughs> there they go. 94. It's a period. Our entire country, 90% to 14%. Population in that state reporting as obese. 95, 96, 97. Another color. Now these, state, these, these states are up to 20% of their population. 98, 99, 2000. It's not getting better, guys. 2001, here we go. 25. Okay? And if anyone, well, Colorado, of course, is always the fittest state, so this ends up being the up. 2002, anyone's been to grocery stores in the South? I have different grocery stores there. Rows and rows and rows of industrial seed oils. Uh, 2003, 2004, 2005, okay, 2005, now we have a 30% color. Okay, no state, by the way, has gone the other way, right? This is the history of our country since 84. 2006, 2007, 2008. Now, 2010, it changed. No, 2010 has 30%, 2011. Okay, I'm to change the map. I just want to show you this because previously red, 30 to 35% is now orange. Okay, they just had to change the map. You know why? Because they can see 35% is coming. They don't have it on there yet, but they can see we're only getting worse. So this is 2012, 2013, there's our 35%, 2014, 15, 17, have to get the 19 and 20 data. But I show these, anyone who sees these slides has to say what is going on here. Do we just have a country of all of these no willpower, they don't care, let themselves go, just like get heavier and heavier over time. Of course not. Of course not. People are trying so hard to figure this stuff out. And so my argument is always eat far too many carbohydrates and industrial seed oils, which are very um, magnified in that photo, and it truly is killing us. So I want you to think, never consume so many carbohydrates in the history of America. We have never spent more money on diet, fads, supplements, and gym memberships, but we have never been fatter and sicker. It doesn't stop. So this is why what I teach about is macronutrients and why they matter for weight loss. All of those slides that I just showed you, if you recall, was the rise of the low-fat craze in our country, the removal of healthy fats, and the substantial increase in sugar. It's the worst way to eat, and it's killing this country. And so we really have to focus on macronutrients, which is prioritizing protein, filling in with fat, and then carefully adding carbs. I want you to consider just taking crackers out of your diet forever. I mean, I even hesitate to use the word diet because really what I teach in my courses and with my one-on-one -on -one clients is, I wanna teach you how to be lean and fit for life. That's what I do. It's, it's just an unlearning of the way you are raised, of how you look at food, how you prepare meals, of what you buy at the grocery store, of how you order at restaurants. It's literally learning a new language. If I was going to learn French, which I do not speak, I would, sure, could I teach myself through Rosetta Stone and go through all it? Probably. Would I enjoy it? Probably not. <laughs> I would hire a coach to get me to understand it, and then I would go and probably immerse myself and have some experiments, go to France, try to talk to people. You would do things to cause you to learn experientially, and that's what I do with my clients and with my courses. I love when I'm working with a client for three months, let's say, and at some point they're like, oh, Kristen, I'm really stressed out. I have to, I'm going on vacation. I don't know what to do. I'm like, this is perfect. You get to practice being in the real world, and this is how you're gonna be able to do it long term. 
Okay, that's what I do. Now, I'm not recommending that people have to track every single thing that they eat for the rest of their lives. I do because I love to do it, but even I take breaks from it because it can be annoying sometimes. I just like to see how much am I eating of protein, how much am I eating of fat, and how much am I eating of carbs. And unless you actually start tracking it and paying attention to what you're putting in your body, your guess is probably pretty inaccurate. They've done lots of studies about people retrospectively looking at what they eat and self-reporting what they ate, and people are grossly underestimating, overestimating. It's just, it's just listening to a podcast the other day where these trainers were talking about having gotten a woman ready for one of her bodybuilding shows, and he had had in one particular meal, she had three ounces of and she wasn't losing weight and wasn't losing weight, and she's like, Oh, I just don't know what I'm doing. He said, well, you're measuring it. Are you weighing your food before you eat it? Well, no, I'm just kind of eyeballing it, but I know what three ounces look like. So he's like, okay, tomorrow I want you to weigh it. Let's see. She weighed it and she measured it. Oh my God, I was eating nine ounces of chicken. It's three times what she was supposed to be eating, but she just thought, oh, that looks like three ounces. And so I do measure my food. I know that sounds like kind of a lot. It's one of those things I've actually learned to embrace and love simply because I want to know what I'm putting in my body. And frankly, I want to make sure I know I'm getting enough protein and enough healthy fat. Yes? Do you measure your protein raw or cooked? I measure it cooked. Great question. I get a lot of clients that ask that. I think that I have several people, colleagues, who do what I do and who go through this really comprehensive mathematical equation to figure out the difference between raw and cooked. I think that's too much. So I recommend everyone because it's just easier. Everyone. I want, I want um, progress, not perfection. Okay, so I just want to show you a case study because this is just the power of changing up your macronutrients. This is early 40s threads business owners are actually in real estate, both extremely busy, and we worked together for six months, and I was planning their meals, so I was writing the meal plans, which is what I do for all of my clients, and saying, here's what you're going to eat and at these times, and eventually then they're like, oh, I never thought of putting this and this together, and so all of a sudden you're able to do it on your own long term, but you have to have that help for a period of time until you learn the new language, learn French. So this husband after just 60 days, even though we worked And this was him changing from eating off his kid's plate, always having fries at the lunch out, having a bun with his burger, to taking away all of that, and it made a significant difference. Now this, I require all of my clients to go down to Discover Strength in Chanhassen and get what's called a bod pod. And the reason I do that is because I like to know where their body composition is starting. So that, what is calories are you burning if you were just to sit in a chair all day, if you were just to lay in bed all day and not move, not blink, not brush your teeth, not get up and go to the bathroom, what is your RMR? So it spits out all of that data for me. And then I can make recommendations for you in terms of how to consume carbs, how to consume proteins, how to consume fat. So my goal with my clients is for, and everyone's journey is different, okay? This is a man, and men tend to just gain muscle and lose fat faster. It's annoying, but they do. <laughs> so this is body fat on the left going down, muscle mass on the right going up. This is from his wife, body fat on the left going down, muscle mass on the right going up. So that's more realistic. There might be a little dip at first, especially for someone who hasn't done a strength training before. But I have had clients who are like, I, I'm not going to strength train, Kristen. I just, I really need to focus on the nutrition. So we'll focus on the nutrition and they even see improvements in muscle mass simply because they're focusing on eating more protein, which is amazing. So really critical. And this is just one other quick case study of a single woman, late 30s, career woman and mom, also works in real estate. And she hired me for three months and she had sent me this before and of her when she hired me, and she's beautiful in both photos, but she wanted to tighten up. She wanted to improve her body composition. When she hired me, she was practicing a vegan diet because she had heard that vegan was healthy. And I said, here's the thing with veganism. It does work for some people. For most people, it doesn't work long term. For her, it was causing her to just over, over eat, over eat carbs because her body was crying out for protein and fat, and she wasn't giving it as much. So it really comes down to what does your body need and how can we give you more of what your body needs? But this was body fat on the left for her, muscle mass going up on the right. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say macros. And 
These are particular images that I got online just to show you an example of the difference between what the typical Western look on these color wheels. Red means carbs, blue means protein, and green means fat. So most Americans are eating something like what's on the left, where a large portion of what they eat are carbohydrates. The middle, who's heard of the zone diet? Anyone? Zone? Okay. So the middle one is more like a zone diet. That's kind of what Jennifer Aniston was doing in the 90s, the 40-30-30 thing. Um, that's less carbs. And then way over on the right hand is keto. So keto is great for people who have traumatic brain injury, who have a history of Alzheimer's in their family, who have epilepsy. Being in a state of ketosis as much as possible is really important for those people because keto is so And unless you become metabolically flexible, unless you teach your body how to burn fat for fuel, your body won't really know what to do. It, it won't be making ketones or producing ketones because it's having to deal with all of the glucose that you're consuming all the time. Okay? Is this making sense so far? Okay. So um, does anyone, clients, want to take a guess of what is the root of all disease? There's one word. Sugar is a great guess. It's the consequence of sugar. Inflammation. Someone said it. Yes. Inflammation. So inflammation is at the root of all autoimmune diseases, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, and a host of other chronic illnesses. And the reason that I want you guys to understand and have a goal of becoming metabolically flexible is because it's going to dramatically reduce the inflammation in your body. Okay? So I'm going to step away from the microphone. I can just do this demonstration quick because I feel like this is so helpful. And my clients who have seen this know that when I do this, it's like, okay, everyone gets it. Okay, so when you eat, let's just say you went to McDonald's, okay? And you ate, well, let me back up. Who can tell me, I'm going to have you guess this first. <laughs> if you have normal blood sugar, because we all have some blood sugar, okay? Everyone has it. So if you have normal blood sugar and you're not diabetic, how much sugar if you're just normal, is in your blood. And I want you to think about it in terms of a kitchen utensil measurement. Does anyone want to take a guess? Something that we use in a recipe. Great guess. It's actually a teaspoon. Okay, so one teaspoon is normal blood sugar. The crazier part about that, you guys, is the difference between you having normal blood sugar at one teaspoon and you having diabetes, one-fourth of a teaspoon. That's it. So you're probably thinking, hang on a second. I've eaten 17 cookies before. How do I not have diabetes, right? I've eaten way more than one teaspoon of sugar in a sitting. We all have. How do I not have diabetes? Here's how. So this is where I'm going to teach you how weight loss works. And this is when all of the stuff that I've been sharing with you will come together and make sense to you. Because really, once you understand what's happening in your body in response to that sugary meal, it's like, okay, now this is starting to click, okay? So when you eat, let's, let's take the standard McDonald's example, because I love this example. A medium McDonald's French fries, just a medium, just the fries, five teaspoons of sugar, okay? Five. Your body can only handle one at a time. So let's pretend you go to McDonald's, and now you've got the Big Mac, you've got a large fry, and because you were feeling super generous that day, you also got a McFlurry, okay? You've eaten all of this. You have set off a bomb of sugar in your body, literally Niagara Falls of sugar, right? Because your body only wants a teaspoon. And guess what, you guys? Your body actually does not want you to get diabetes. It's like, no, I don't want that, please. So it's working very hard all the time to prevent you from getting diabetes. So now you've eaten this whole McDonald's meal, and let's say even worse, now you're sitting in the car road tripping to Wisconsin, okay? You're just sitting there. At least if you were going to take a walk after the McDonald's, some of that sugar could start to power your legs, power your arms. It would be used by your body for fuel. That's what it would be doing. Okay, so one of the best things, write this down, one of the best things you can do after any meal is to walk for 10 minutes. 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's one of the fastest ways to lower your blood sugar. Why? Because all of that that you've just ingested is prioritization number one for what 
gets used when you start doing your walk. I will get done with my dinner and I put the dogs on the leash and I go outside, I'll just even walk around the block. And I wear a blood sugar monitor so I can compare. It's, it's crazy how quick it comes down. I even tested it last summer where I walked with a friend down to Sebastian Joe's on Hennepin, got two scoops of Nicolette pothole ice cream, which is so good, had whipped cream on it, like I went crazy. And then we walked all the way around Lake of the Isles and back towards my house on Calhoun, and I had a blood sugar monitor on. My blood sugar stayed stable and low because it was fueling my walk that entire time. I got home, it went up a little bit when I stopped walking and it came right back down. So when I walked, I burned off all that ice cream because I was using it. Your body preferentially wants to get rid of it. So if you start moving after you have that sugar, it's way better for you, okay? So you're sitting on your road trip to Wisconsin. You've eaten all this McDonald's. Here's what happens in your body in response to that meal. It's like, oh my God, clean up on aisle four. Holy shit, this is horrible. It's an, it's an emergency situation. Your body is like, oh, I don't want to get diabetes. I don't want to get diabetes. What do I do? So literally the ambulance comes out, the fire truck and the police cars, they're all coming out of your pancreas. Now your pancreas is on your left side, okay? Your liver's on your right. They talk to each other. But in response to that horrible sugar meal, your pancreas starts to pump out insulin. You guys have all heard of insulin. Someone who's diabetic has to pump insulin into themselves. We have to have insulin to live. We have to, but most Americans are pumping out way too much all day long, okay? Insulin is a hormone. So people think of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone as hormones. Insulin is also a hormone, okay? It is a hormone whose job is to clean the sugar out of your blood. Clean, 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 clean. Oh God, oh God, she ate the fries, she ate the Big Mac. Oh God, go clean it, go clean it. What do we do? Oh God, she's just sitting in this car on the way to Wisconsin. Ah, what do I do? So now the insulin has to put all that sugar somewhere. So it's like, hurry, oh, right there, I know. Boom, goes into your liver, okay? Your liver can hold about 400 calories of sugar on average. 400 cal carbs. Guess what, guys, that's hardly any. Hardly any, it's not very much. That's maybe part of the fries. Okay, so now your liver's full. It's like, uh oh, uh oh, emergency, clean up on aisle four. It's still happening. What do we do? Where do we put it? <gasps> okay, oh, there's somewhere. Perfect. So the second spot it goes is your skeletal muscle. So I always say I have a 20 gallon storage tank for carbs where most people are walking around a five. One of the best things you can do to improve your body composition, your insulin sensitivity, and become more metabolically flexible is to gain lean muscle tissue because it's one of your storage tanks for carbs. It's one of the best things you can do. It's one of the best things you can do for anti-aging too. We now know, based on the science, that not only does strength training improve literally every single marker of aging, but that includes your cognitive health, in addition to obviously your body composition, your bone density, your hormonal function, every single thing is improved by strength training. But the most important thing as it relates to what I'm talking about is it gives you a bigger storage tank for carbs. Because guess what? With that meal that you just ate at McDonald's, your liver is full after about 400 calories. Your skeletal muscle for the average person is full after about 1,000 to 1,200 calories, which I know sounds like a lot, you guys. It's really not that much. I'm guessing a small McFlurry has at least that much in terms of calories, all of which is sugar. So now you have your liver full, now you have your skeletal muscle full, your insulin is still like, oh God, oh God, the fire trucks are still here, we gotta get all the sugar out, what do we do? Because remember, it's gotta get you back to a teaspoon. So that sugar has to go somewhere. It cannot sit in your bloodstream, it can't. So once your liver is full, and then your skeletal muscle is full, guess what? Fat, and that's how we get fat. That's all it is. You've stored carbohydrates all over in your fat cells. So adipose tissue is your fat cells. It is part of your endocrine system. It's an organ. People think that's crazy that fat is an organ, but it is. And if you're metabolically flexible, your fat should work with your body, not against it. So because our adipose tissue can just grow and grow and grow, if our skeletal muscle are constantly full of carbs and we don't clear them out through water, Walking, through strength training, through eating low carbohydrate, through fasting, all of these things that help you become metabolically flexible, you will just continue to grow more fat cells 
to store the carbs, okay? So have you guys heard the term triglycerides? It's one of those things you get every time you, get, you do your blood markers, right? It's probably the most important thing you can watch over time. Why? When your triglycerides come down, you are a lot more metabolically well. Western medicine will say under 150 is good. I say I want them under 75, okay? Under 75, if you follow any um, functional medicine doctors, any of the famous ones, Dr. Mark Hyman, others, they will say under 75 too. And what are triglycerides? It is, okay, think of tricycle, tri, T-R-I, three things, right? That's what tri means. Tri, gliss, glycerol. This is a glycerol molecule. This is sugar. It is three fatty acids to a glycerol backbone. This is what's sitting in your fat cells, triglycerides. So the first number that comes down when clients hire me is this one. Why? Because when I get you eating low carb, when I get you fasting, when I get you strength training, when I get you moving more, all of the things that cause your body to need fuel, and now I've taken your carbohydrates out so much so your body only can go to dietary fat and then it can start to burn body fat, your pancreas, which normally is so busy secreting insulin because that's what's storing all of those carbs, now has to say, uh-oh, 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 we're not at a teaspoon, we're not at a teaspoon, we're getting too low, we're getting too low, we're getting too low. Your body also doesn't want to be too low. It wants to be at a teaspoon. Now when you go below a teaspoon, your pancreas, who was so busy spitting out insulin all day, instead spits out glucagon. Glucagon, G-L-U-C-A-G-O-N, is the opposing hormone to insulin. Glucagon is your best friend for fat loss. You want glucagon working because glucagon is going to say, oh, remember when she ate that McDonald's meal and then she sat and went to Wisconsin? Yeah, we stored all those carbs. Remember that? They're all stored back here. This little glycerol molecule tied to the fatty acids, they're all sitting in our fat cells. I remember that now. I'm going to get those and I'm going to use those for fuel. She doesn't need to eat again. She's got stuff. It's stored. We're going to eat those. There's a story of an obesity doctor who, with um, a lot of coordination with a lot of other doctors, helped one of their patients fast for one year. And he's fine, and he's alive, and he lost like 150 pounds. And it's because all of those stored triglycerides could be used for fuel. Does this make sense? I, when I learned this, you guys, I was like mind blown. Okay, this is going to change the way I eat and look at food forever. It's so helpful. Okay, so I've talked a lot about strength training because mu building muscle is probably the most important thing you guys can do in terms of improving your insulin sensitivity. Now, I've said insulin sensitivity a few times. Does anyone want to take a guess what that means, clients excluded? Anyone? <laughs> okay, so insulin sensitivity is on one end. Insulin resistance is on the other. Insulin resistance is the last train stop before diabetes. We want to become more insulin sensitive. Insulin sensitive means our body's kind of like sensitive, surprise, oh, there's some carbs, whoa, cool. Now I can deal with those. It's sensitive to the input of carbs. It actually can respond to them and be surprised by them and not like, oh yeah, more carbs. So, same, same thing, different day. And it gets really tired. It gets resistant to the noise of carbs. It's like the peanuts teacher, the boy who cried wolf. Uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And then your pancreas gets so tired of having to pump out insulin all day long because you're constantly feeding it carbohydrates all day that it says, forget it. I'm just going to push the button down on the insulin and I'm just going to let it pump out all day long because I'm sick of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. So now you become a fat storage machine because you have the insulin pump on all day long telling your body to store fat. That's what insulin is doing. So is this not totally different than what you guys have always heard, which is calories in, calories out, that's all that matters, right? It's totally different. I mean, our bodies are hormonal, complex systems, and they work weight gain and weight loss because of our hormone function. And insulin's a hormone, and glucagon's a hormone, okay? So I think the most efficient and effective exercises are the ones that burn fat. I mean, if I'm going to be in the gym or if I'm going to do anything, I want it to be something that I enjoy, but that actually is going to improve my body composition, and that's strength training. So I spoke at the Resistance Exercise Conference in Las Vegas in October, and 
one of the things that was fascinating about the scientists that were speaking alongside of me is how much amazing research has come out in the last several years about strength training. By way of summary, not only does it provide body composition benefits, but there are insane metabolic benefits. You're going to jack up your metabolism by improving you have on your body. You get massive cognitive benefit from strength training, cardiovascular benefits. For most of us, we always heard cardio is king. We have to do cardio. Cardio is the most important thing. Uh uh. That's like the 1990s called, and they want their exercise back. So I'm not saying don't do cardio. Cardio is fun. It gets you to sweat. I love cardio. I obviously have run a ton. However, if you told me I could only do one exercise for the rest of my life, strength training is the only thing I would do. It's the most important thing for you. Okay? Um, there's anti-aging benefits. Sarcopenia is the term for what, me, what is age-related muscle wasting. It's the reason that lots of women in their 70s and 80s break their hips. It's the reason that can't live independently and have to go to a nursing home for many people. If I had the internet up here, I would show you guys all, and I want you to all Google this at some point, one of my favorite women who I talk about all the time, which is a woman named Ernestine Shepard. She is an 86-year-old bodybuilder, and she is jacked. And she is proof that if you use it, you do not lose it. Her name's Ernestine Shepard. The other woman that I want you guys to consider looking up or following, she's got probably a million some followers now on Instagram, is a woman whose website is Train with Joan. Maybe it's Train with Joan official. Train with Joan. Anyways, she's 75 years old. And the best part about her story is she tells it on the homepage of her website. At 70 years old, she was 198 pounds. 5'3", she had all sorts of bad markers. She turned all this around in five years by starting strength training and exercising. So I tell everyone, I refuse to accept that you have to gain weight and lose muscle tissue as you age. You don't. You really don't. The only reason that we've seen that in our society is because people stop strength training and they don't prioritize what they put into their bodies. Okay? Um, I said metabolic benefits twice. Forgive me. Hormone benefits, just like I talked about your benefits. I can tell you from my own personal experience, although there's research around this too, every morning if I strength train, I'm more likely to make better food choices that day. I'm more likely to say, I need to eat more protein. I'm more likely to say, okay, I'm not going to have that glass of wine tonight. You know, you're going to make better choices because behaviorally, you've already started the day on a better foot. Okay? Life satisfaction benefits, I can say this. I have been strength training. I started in the gym when I was 14 years old, but I've been strength training as an adult pretty regularly with a particular gym that I strength train at, which is called Discover Strength. I've been working out there with them since November of 2007, and I can't say enough good things about it. So there are many different places that you can look at in the Twin Cities, but strength training is really the most important thing. And really, it's because of what I shared before. Body composition is the goal. I don't care really what the pounds on the scale are. I care that you're losing body fat and gaining lean muscle tissue over time. Because that's really what's going to improve your quality of life and your longevity. We want to age well. OK, so these are the four parts of your metabolism. And I haven't talked about this yet, but I want to spend just a few minutes on this because I feel like this is important to drive home what I've already shared. A significant part of your metabolism, your metabolism is made up of four things. Resting metabolic rate, biggest one. I showed you those bod pods, and I said, it gives me your RMR. It gives me your resting metabolic rate. Your resting metabolic rate is a direct function of how much muscle you have on your body. So it is the most important thing for increasing your metabolism. The second most important thing is what I write here, which is NEAT. That stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Everything you do throughout the day to move other than exercise. All of this, blinking, chewing, everything, okay? Gone is the lifestyle of I wake up in the morning, I go to the gym, and then I go to my desk, and I sit there all day. That, okay, this is your thermic effect of exercise. If you're focused on that, how bang for your buck you get for your metabolism. It would be way more valuable for you to implement a strength training program and then make sure you're taking multiple walks during the day so that you're getting your steps up, so that you're increasing your need, so that you're doing the dishes, sweeping, doing laundry, up and down. Uh, when I pulled up here, I parked far away in the parking lot. Extra steps. I didn't park the closest, even though it's cold. Okay? It's stuff like that getting extra movement in your day. And then TEF is your thermic effect of food. And what that simply means is protein, fats, and carbs. 
they have different thermogenicity in terms of how your body digests them. So when you consume protein, it's the most thermogenic macronutrient. Burn the most calories or you expend the most energy digesting protein and assimilating the components of it into your body, the amino acids, which is what we need, okay? Carbohydrates are second, and then fat is last in terms of thermogenicity. But fat is more satiating than carbs, and carbs will keep you on that blood sugar roller coaster, right? Does everyone know what I'm talking about with the blood sugar roller coaster, right? You wake up, you eat something, you get to the top of the roller coaster, you're at Excalibur at Valley Fair, and then you get down here, it's like, lay off me, I'm starving. Like, you hate everyone. I just need to eat something. And then you up here, eat something. This, okay, not only does it tell you every time you go up to the top of the roller coaster, store fat, store fat, store fat. Why? Because this is causing that pancreas to pump out insulin. So every time you eat a ton of carbs and you go up here, more insulin, more fat storage. Now you go down here, it's like, I got to eat something. So you do this all day. This thing causes what I showed you before, which is inflammation. It's the other reason I don't want you on a butter sugar roller coaster. It's the other reason I want you to be able to have 100 carbs in a day and the next day fast until 2 o'clock without feeling it, without like wanting to kill someone at 9.15 in the morning. That is a sign to me that you constantly run on carbs. If you can't fast, and trust me, most people can't. I'm not, this is no judgment and no shaming if you can't. I spend the first five weeks with my clients teaching them how to learn how to train their body to burn fat for fuel. And then we get into fasting. Because I want it to, when I started fasting, it was like, okay, I'll eat at 9 a.m., then the next day at 10 a.m., then the next day I'll eat at 11 a.m. Okay, this is kind of scary. And then it becomes easier because your body can switch between fuel sources. Have you guys ever heard of in a marathon when people get to this point where they hit the wall? Has anyone ever heard that term? Okay, so the wall typically happens for most people at mile 20. Why? Because mile 20, on average, people are around two hours into the marathon at that point. Two hours is how long your body can run on carbs. Run on fat for 40 hours. Four zero. Two versus 40. What's a more efficient fuel source? Fat, of course. So. For many, many years of marathoning, I would do the carbo loading the night before. I would eat my oatmeal in the morning. I would have goose during the race because every time I would dip down with energy, it's like oh, more carbs, more carbs, more carbs. My fastest marathon after I learned all this stuff and became fat fueled, when I finally became metabolically flexible, the night before the race, instead of pasta, I ate steak and butter and asparagus. The morning of the race, instead of oatmeal and toast and banana, I ate, oops, that's my timer, sorry. I ate um, one packet of coconut butter that had 20 grams of fat, and I had nothing else the entire race, and I felt amazing. And I didn't hit a wall, because the wall is what happens when your body is switching from glucose to now burning fat. Now, I started at start line of the marathon burning fat. So that's why I never hit that wall thing that people talk about. And it felt very different. My race was so much more enjoyable. Fatty acids are a way more efficient fuel source once you train your body how to use them for fuel. Does anyone have any questions about that? Thermic effect of food, thermic effect of exercise. By the way, the thermic effect of exercise, you only get 10% credit on that if you're like a professional athlete. I mean, this is like NFL, football, but you know, those of us normal people, it's 5%. If you don't work out at all, it's zero. So you can see exercise is least important other than strength training, because strength training is building your resting metabolic rate. Okay. So I've already told you what these fuel sources are, but just by way of a recap, number one, glucose carbs. Number two, dietary fat. Only once we get rid of the carbs and then we burn out all the dietary fat can we start to burn body fat, which is number three. And then as a consequence of that, we will start to produce ketones for our brain, which is so healing. I want to make sure that I'm respectful of time and that I um, leave time for questions, so you guys please pop in, but I do want to because this is the whole thing about fasting. I'm guessing if I asked every single one of you in this room, no one had a parent, teacher, professor, mentor, coach, relative, or anyone who was fasting when they were growing up. It just wasn't a thing, right? None of us did. Why not? Why not? Other than autophagy wasn't discovered until 2015. Uh, we grew up with these messages. You must always eat breakfast. You must snack constantly all day long. You should eat a bedtime snack. 
you must never ever miss a meal. I know when I was introduced to fasting, these were all the things I said. I was like, are you kidding me? No, no, I'm gonna shut down my metabolism. Fasting is gonna make me gain weight. When you think about it, how insane is that? That that's the programming that we all grew up with. You have to eat, you have to eat, you have to eat. It's literally a program. We are programmed like in the matrix to believe all this stuff. None of that's supported by science. Yes, it's true, you want to eat periodically to keep your blood sugar stable if you're not metabolically flexible, but if you're metabolically flexible, you could go two, three days without food and be fine. But we're not because we're all eating these carbs. Why? These messages is because we all grew up in generations of big food. So you guys, the processed packaged food, the whole genesis behind it was when we came came through world wars and we had to send food with our soldiers to go and fight for our country. We didn't even have processed packaged food before that. And then these companies were like, wait a second, we can sell this to people and we can have shareholders and we can make money. And now we can hire scientists to actually manufacture foods that cause what's called a bliss point where we can make it just addictive enough where people come back and they buy more I mean, this is what teams of scientists at all of these companies have on staff. If you really want to dive deep into this topic, there's a fantastic book called Sugar, Salt, Fat by Michael, is it Moss or more? Michael, I think it's Michael Moss. He won a Nobel Prize also. It's fascinating. And then there's another one called The Dorito Effect, which goes into similar stuff. But it's really about big food. So the truth is that in Paleolithic times, our ancestors went for long times without food. Our bodies are designed to do that, and fasting helps us to become metabolically flexible. And that means, again, switching between those fuel sources. The real issue is no one makes money when you fast. That's why. If people, if someone figured out how to make money, and trust me, I already have had people DM me on Instagram, well, we're coming out with this fasting bar. Would you promote our fasting bar? I'm like, it's fasting. Why are we eating a bar? But people are trying to monetize it now, right? So that's really what the issue is. Okay, and the last thing I just want to say, if you choose to implement a low-carbohydrate diet, if you want more information from me about that, if you ever want one-on-one -on -one coaching or in my group coaching, you'll hear me talk a lot about water and electrolytes, and it's because when you go low-carb, you have to increase your Talk about because not having enough electrolytes. Carbohydrates have the word hydrate in them in part because they help your body retain water. So when you cut them out, you will lose a lot of water weight right away. And you also flush out a lot of your minerals, and then you don't feel good because your body actually needs minerals. And electrolytes give you minerals, so electrolytes, and that's why I recommend them. Okay, and then just lastly, useful metabolic tools. I have a whole list of them if you want to take a photo of this. These are just things that I recommend. Um, sorry about that, I'm trying to go back. It's not working. <laughs> Trying to go back, I'll, I'll put that one up in a second. I do recommend that people get annual blood work. Help going back up for people. Um, I say get a regular Bod Powder DEXA scan. I have a quarterly detox that I offer, which is excellent. Um, and then I always say, if you really want to be, tell people out loud that you're doing a challenge for yourself. People, I'm doing carnivore for 30 days. I'm not going to drink alcohol for 30 days. Dry January is the thing for a reason. When you announce it, it makes you more committed. Okay? And so this is really last how I want to conclude. Um, I talk a lot about my method. I am an IPE professional bodybuilder. It simply means international pro elite. But I realized as I was coming up with my very first talk that I gave at KetoCon several years ago that really what I see in terms of both myself and in clients is this is really the path to success. You set your intention, you make it specific enough, specific enough to have a goal, then you either create a plan or hire someone else to help you with it. I help clients all day long create plans for how we're going to get them to their goal, and then your only job if you do those two things is to execute on it every day. And I promise you if you, if you do each three of those steps, each of those steps uh, will cause you to be successful. So questions, of course, and how you can connect with me. Talk about the April, April quick. Oh, two to three minutes because it's annoying. Yes, well, thank you. That's true. So, if anyone has not heard of this yet, there is a list of what's called the hateful eight industrial seed oils. The hateful eight is a term that was coined by Dr. Kate Shanahan. She wrote the book Deep Nutrition. I had to read that in nutritional therapy school. And 
It is the list of the oils that I recommend you do not ever consume. And I'll tell you what they are. They are the hateful eight. And if you look at packaged processed foods in grocery stores, they are in everything. So it will really cause you to wake up to this issue. So here's a list. Corn, canola, cottonseed, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, rapeseed or rapeseed oil. Rapeseed is really canola oil. And then rice bran. That's the hateful eight. You guys, canola oil is in pretty much everything. The three foods I pick on the most in my course. Yes. Corn oil, canola oil, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, grapeseed or rapeseed oil, and rice bran oil. Yeah, thank you, Will. So the three foods I pick on the most in my courses and in my one-on-one coaching, just to give an example, because everyone has these in their cupboard. <laughs> I used to too. Wheat thins, which I already talked about, honey nut Cheerios, and brown berry bread. Everyone has them. And y'all think they're healthy. I did too. Go look at a Wheat Thins label. Go look at a Honey Nut Cheerios label. It is sugar, gluten, and canola oil. That's all that's in Honey Nut Cheerios. And the reason that they call those oils the hateful eight is because they kidnap your metabolism and they make it very difficult for you to lose weight. So really what I do with my coaching is I take all of those oils out of your diet. And most people say to me, oh my God, Kristen, what am I going to eat? How can I eat? You will be shocked at how much there is to eat once you start to look at food differently. The probably top five things I hear from my clients most when they start with me is, I can't believe how many things I get to eat. I can't believe how much I get to eat. Oh my gosh, this food tastes so good. I'm not hungry and holy cow, I'm losing weight. And I know that sounds too good to be true. I get it. I really do. And I promise it's not. I'm teaching a new way of how to look at food and I'm educating you about how your body really works because no one talks about this in school or in college or anywhere else, and I'm on a mission to help other people understand it. I'm going to go back to useful metabolic tools. Yes, you have a question. So I think the Whole30 is great, and my desire is for people to do something that can be a whole lifestyle. So if you do the Whole30 and you recognize how beneficial it is and how good you feel, and you can stick with it, that's amazing. What I find with most people is they need to know, okay, what are the bars, Kristen, that you would approve if I'm in a pinch and I'm running around? What, what do you think is okay if I, what's the best choice when I'm out to a restaurant with my family and they don't have anything good and what could I get? So I work a lot with that because I want you to be able to live in the real world and not be on a Whole30 versus off a Whole30. I want you to be on like the whole life program. <laughs> so... I think it's great, and I do quarterly detoxes that are only 14 days, and I've been doing them every year for over 20 years, and every time I do one, I learn something new that I take with me, you know? Like, it's like I incorporate sauerkraut way more than I used to five years ago, because I know how good it is for my gut. Yes? What's your favorite protein? Okay, so I would have told you, about a month or two ago, I would have told you whey protein, because I love it. I just recently took a food sensitivity test that told me I'm totally inflamed by whey, so I can't have it right now, which sucks. So um, now what I'm doing is alternative. So I'm doing a beef protein isolate because it has a really good bioavailability of amino acids. So animal proteins are generally a lot more bioavailable for muscle building than our plant proteins. I am using a plant protein powder that's fortified with amino acids. So I recommend if pea proteins or those things work better for you, then a scent which is at Whole Foods. They just came out with a new one. It's in a green bag. They have a plant protein powder. And then the other one is Garden of Life because they add a lot of amino acids to it. What I find with most plant protein powders is there are a lot more calories and a lot less protein for the same amount of protein. You could eat like this much protein of beef and this much protein of plant and get this many more amino acids in the beef protein. So bang for your buck, I recommend beef over pea. Yes? So like when I go home today, like what, where do I start? What do I do? <laughs> Great question. Great question. I'm so glad you asked. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys could get out for whoever's on Instagram, if you get out on Instagram right now, follow me. I put up a little link for you guys that says my top five tips and tricks. So you can download that from my link in bio on my golden girl, MN golden girl for Instagram. Um, I actually couldn't get MN golden girl for Twitter because whoever did have that account, 
was doing something where they like violated Twitter's rules. And so <laughs> I don't know what they were doing. So I had to switch it around. So on my Instagram, I literally put up a little thing for you guys. That's my top five tips and tricks. So if you click on that, it'll email it to you. And that tells you five things you can start doing now. And the, probably the biggest thing, and I'll give you this as a takeaway, is I really, really, really recommend that everyone start the day with a thing of water like this, okay? So I start every single day, and my clients all know this, and they all do it, and maybe one of them would be willing to attest to the benefits of this with the juice of one lemon and a fourth a teaspoon of Redmond real salt. Why? Lemon is very detoxifying for your body. So it's going to help you detoxify you every day. It also, there are only a few things that stimulate our lymph, and lemon is one of them. So your lymph, remember, you, you obviously know you have blood that flows and you pump blood and it moves throughout the body. You also have interstitial fluid called lymph that just like sits there unless you move it. So you move your lymph by drinking lemon water, having lemon, by jumping like on a trampoline. I bought a mini trampoline last year. So you could jump for five minutes a day. You could get a lymphatic drainage massage. You could dry brush. You could do acupuncture. All those things stimulate your lymph. But an easy way to do it is to put lemon in your water in the morning. And then I recommend a fourth a teaspoon of salt with it because back up to my slide about water and electrolytes, salt gives you electrolytes. Think of electrolytes as the EMs. Sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium. It's all those macro minerals that we need, and they're in salt. And the reason I recommend Redmond's is because it is mined in Utah, and it's from, it, it, I think the mines have been in their family for over 100 years. So it's very high quality salt that isn't polluted because of microplastics in the sea, and that's a topic for a different day, but apparently the water is now so polluted with garbage, you guys, that they're finding microplastics in fish and in salt that comes from the sea, which is horrifically depressing to me. So I recommend Redmond salt. And I do, if you guys download my tips and tricks, I have discount codes on some of that stuff if you want to try any of that. So the Redmonds especially, because you can at grocery stores in town, they have really good electrolytes that you can only order online. Yes. Hi, Brenda. So good. It's amazing. Oh, yes. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So here's what's fun. In the food tracking app that I use, every single ingredient on the Chipotle menu is on that. So I always say, okay, guys, if you're going to go to Chipotle, you're running around, you didn't pack any food for the day, you're not organized, you can get something there. So most people go there and they do either burrito or some kind of bowl that has a big base of lots and lots and lots of carbs, rice. And then people say, well, I was being healthy, so I got brown rice. Uh-uh. Guess what, guys? First of all, white rice is actually better for you. Brown rice has tons of lectins in it. So we were sold all this line of BS that brown rice is better than white. It's way harder for your body to digest, so I don't recommend brown rice. But I actually would encourage you to consider going to Chipotle and skipping the rice altogether. They do have cauliflower rice now, so you can try that. I've heard mixed reviews. Some clients love it. Some clients are like, please don't make me eat that again. So let's say you don't want the rice at all. You don't want to have cauliflower rice. You could get the fajita vegetables. Okay, as your base, because remember, when we're carefully adding carbs, I would love for it to largely be from vegetables and some fruits. Fajita vegetables, a bunch of lettuce. You could get beef barbacoa, chicken. You could get um, whatever their pork is, their carnitas. You could get the steak. The steak at Chipotle is actually leaner than the chicken. I recently learned that. So you could get any of those. Sometimes you could do two meats if you need more protein. And then you could do cheese, sour cream, guacamole. It's a massive amount of food, but you didn't send yourself up the Excalibur to tell your body to start storing fat. If you add rice or beans to that, you're more likely to be up here, okay? So that would be a great Chipotle order. Again, that's prioritizing protein. I'm going to get the chicken, the pork, the steak, or the beef, right, the carnitas. Oh, and then I'm going to fill in with fat, sour cream, cheese, guacamole, and I'm going to carefully add carbs, which are the vegetables and the lettuce, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing, which Brenda's question reminded me of, is a really important tip. This is a takeaway that you guys can do now, okay? Every time you sit down to eat, and I want you to look at this woman on Instagram, too. Her name is, she goes by Glucose Goddess. She does a bunch of cool infographics that show 
what happens when you eat certain foods to the blood sugar response. So if you want to see visually what that roller coaster looks like, go to her Instagram page and look at comparisons. I always say, right, prioritize protein, fill in with fat, carefully add carbs. I'll give you a simple example. She's got an infographic to back this up. When people say, I got a smoothie, I'm like, well, what was in it? Because it matters, right? Probably one of the worst things you can consume, and don't get me started on this because I hate them so much. The what? I know, and one of the worst things is, and what they think is so healthy, is those naked juices. Okay, you guys have compared the nutrition facts on a naked juice. It has as many carbs as a king-size Snickers. No joke. That's all it is is sugar. And people give it to their kids because they think it's healthy. It's not that parents are bad. It's not that they're not trying. It's just that we're sold all sorts of garbage information about nutrition because the only place it's coming from is the government with the food pyramid, don't get me started, or the food plate, which isn't any better. And those are all the result of a lot of lobbying happening in Washington by all interested parties, including Big Pharma and Big Food. None of it, they don't give two craps about your metabolism. They do not care what your body composition is. They care about making money and profits for their shareholders, period. They have teams of scientists on staff creating and coming up with food combinations to actually make you addicted, okay? So going back to this blood sugar balance, what I was going to say is, Another takeaway that you can do right now is, every time you eat, eat the protein first. I was just saying this to a client around the time of her holiday party. I said, when you go to that holiday party and you're in that side room at Crave and they bring out those awesome truffle mashed potatoes, please eat the filet first, vegetables too, put some butter on the vegetables, and then if you're still hungry, then you can have some of the truffle potatoes. And she's like, oh my God, Kristen, I did what you said. I only wanted two bites of the potatoes, it was so weird. I'm like, right, because you already got full because we ate all that protein and the good fat on your vegetables. You were so satiated that you didn't even need or want the potatoes. Now, if you would eat the potatoes first, because your body actually wants the protein and fat, it's what it wants more of, you could eat three vats of potatoes and you're still hungry. And meanwhile, you've eaten the three vats of potatoes and here you are at the top of the Excalibur just waiting for that crash. So eat your protein first always, and if you can round that out with some fat and vegetables, that's the other thing. I do that every time I eat. You will eat, you will eat way less, and you will feel more satiated. And if I could just put a finer point on that, one of the things that I didn't talk about that I wanted to, which I forgot, here's why. We eat. What is looking for, primarily, are two things, okay? Essential amino acids. Have you ever heard that term? EAAs? Essential amino acids. Not BCAAs. Those are branched chain amino acids. I don't think anything of those. I don't recommend them for pre-workouts or ever. But essential amino acids is what we need from food. The other thing we need is essential fatty acids. Okay? Essential amino acids come from protein. Essential fatty acids come from fats. The word essential is in front of them because we have to get them from our food, and we have to have them to live. Our body cannot make them. Our body can do a lot of shit on its own. It can make a lot of stuff to make up for deficiencies that we don't give it for food. It cannot make essential amino acids, and it cannot make essential fatty acids. It has to get those from food. So we will continue to search for them. Our body's smart. It will make us crave things and want things until we get essential amino acids or until we get essential fatty acids. There are no essential carbs. None. None. I know of women, and I say women, I do know of some men too, but largely women, who have been on zero carbohydrate diets for decades. It is one of the best ways, based on the anecdotal conferences I've attended, to overcome bipolar disorder, manic depression, all sorts of other neurological conditions. What your body needs is essential amino acids from protein and essential fatty acids from fat. There are no essential carbs. I'm not saying don't eat carbs. But the reason that we eat them is for the fiber and for some vitamins and minerals that we get. That's it. We really eat them for satiety. It makes us feel full because there's a lot of volume. You eat a cup of Brussels sprouts, you're going to be a lot more flavorful. 
you can crumple a sleeve of Ritz crackers into pixie dust. It's so small. And then you eat it, and your body's like, hey, I swallowed something. You know, I, I got something in here, but I actually need food. Where are the amino acids? Where are the fatty acids? So then, 20 minutes later, you're still hungry, and you're like, I just ate the thing of Ritz crackers. Well, it's not food. It's dust that is just something that gave you a dopamine hit because you tripped that sugar signal. Now you went off the roller coaster. So if you focus on just thinking every time you eat, what does my body need? What does my body need? Okay? And last thing, and I know, Will, you're probably like, can you please stop talking? Last thing on that topic is this. Here's what makes you full. Okay? This is really important. There's three legs of the stool. You guys are like getting everything that I teach today, which is awesome. Three legs of the stool. You release peptide YY, it's a hormone, in response to the consumption of protein. Okay? These are the three things that make you full. That's what you need to be like, I'm good. And I hate even the word full. I always say satiated, right, Sarah? Satiated, satisfied, when we're satisfied. You need to release peptide YY. That's in response to protein. Then you release CCK. It's cholecystokinin, but just short note at CCK. That's in response to fat. And then you need to have volume. And you really get that from the vegetables, okay? So your stomach, here's your stomach. It has proprioreceptors on the inside, which means, okay, proprioreception. I always I use this example. When you walk into a dark room and you're trying to figure out where the walls are, right? It's like, oh, there it is. There, okay. That's what's happening inside your stomach. So when you put food in there and now it touches the wall of your stomach, it's like, oh, okay, I'm good. The combination of that, peptide YY and CCK, it's like, I'm full. I'm satiated. I don't need to eat anymore. So imagine... A skillet meal, which is my favorite thing to recommend clients eat, with grass-fed butter, a bunch of vegetables, a ton of ounces of grass-fed ground beef. You've got protein, healthy fats, and volume. You are so satiated after eating that, you couldn't even eating again for three or four hours. As compared with a sleeve of Ritz crackers, you're hungry 20 minutes later because you didn't stimulate peptide YY, CCK, and you didn't give yourself any volume. Okay, unless anyone has any questions, I'll be quiet. I really, really would love for you guys to get in touch with me. I'm gonna be launching another eight-week nutrition course. There are, um, Sarah, I don't know if you could talk about that because you were in my eight-week nutrition course, but it is really a powerful way to learn all of the stuff that I've just taught you, but in more detail and with meal plans. And I do that over the course of eight weeks. And I'm gonna be launching that again. I'm gonna start it on Valentine's Day because it's a gift of love for yourself. So if anyone's interested in that, I would love to have you join. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Jory, could you put it back on that useful metabolic tools just in case anyone wants to take a photo of that? I don't know how to back pedal in the PowerPoint. Do you know how to go back? I know. I tried that. It just keeps going forward. Oh, it does go back that way. It's okay. I was doing this. I can't know everything. Right? PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. So the tracking your menstrual cycle, that's only for women, just FYI. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but the, I'll show you guys this. So I have the, this on. I wear one of these all the time. So this is the NutriSense Continuous Blood Glucose Monitor. And this is testing my blood sugar. So then I can just take my phone and, and do it with my phone. And then it'll um, tell me what my blood sugar is at. So what I'll do is I'll eat a meal with carbs or I'll eat a meal with sugar and then I'll test it. I'll eat a meal, and then I'll go on a walk for 10 minutes, and I'll test it. I'll go to the gym in the morning. I'll sweat a ton. I'll be in a heated room, and then I'll test it. I'll do all sorts of things in the sauna. Take a cold shower. Two minutes in a cold shower will plummet your blood sugar. It's fascinating. So I do recommend the, the NutriSense. Oops. I do recommend the NutriSense um, if you're interested in doing any sort of experiments. And then the Aura Ring is another thing that I wear. I recommend these to any clients who will get them. They're an excellent tool. I track my sleep, my temperature when I sleep, my steps, my heart rate variability, my heart rate. These are a fantastic, fantastic tool. Nothing will modify your behavior more than wearing one of these and seeing what shitty lifestyle behaviors do to your sleep. Okay? You have some wine, your deep sleep tanks. And this will tell you. You eat too late at night, your deep sleep tanks. You go to bed earlier, you wear blue light blocking glasses before bed, way better sleep. So it really does modify your behavior because it'll make you feel better, too. So. Why a ring, not a watch? 
because I don't want to sleep with a watch on. And this is so minuscule that I don't even notice I have it on. The thing, if you Google Aura Ring, the first thing that comes up is Aura versus Whoop. Because everyone's comparing those two, but the Whoop is a wrist, and I just, I wouldn't want to sleep with it. So this is why I wear it for sleep. And you can turn off the Bluetooth. There's Bluetooth technology in here. You can turn it off with your phone and just put on airplane mode. And then you don't even have to turn it on until you wake up, which is kind of cool. Thank you guys again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yay. All right. OK. Yeah. Thank you. The thing about us Leos is we like to talk. We do. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. all the time. Sorry. So thank you for showing up. I really appreciate it. Um, once again, if you want to join us next month, it'll be the second Tuesday. It will we'll be a more real estate focused thing, but feel free to hang out and have some food, coffee, and I don't know Kirsten's going to be around, and yep. there's several people in here who have used her, and ha feel free to ask any questions. We're here to help. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.